Okay. All right. <laughs> Today we are going to start talking about phenomenology. What, from what we've discussed so far, or from your own experience, or from your readings, what is a phenomenology? What kind of a study are we looking at? You're trying to look at a phenomenon that has occurred or may occur. Yeah, don't, don't overthink it. Go with the name. You've looked at a phenomenon. What has happened? What has occurred? Okay. These are some examples of questions you might ask uh, to do a phenomenological study. Why has school spirit increased at UCM? We've got this phenomenon. All of a sudden, you walk across this campus and you're noticing almost everybody is either wearing cardinal and black or they're wearing UCM shirts. Attendance at sporting events is higher among students. Uh, you got more students, you're, you're going to the concerts and the plays on campus and you're seeing all these students going through there. People seem to be happier about being here. What is it with this? Why is there such a, uh, an increase in school spirit? Why are more Americans buying domestic cars? Well, you know, you're a car aficionado and um, you're, you follow the car, the car magazines and you follow the stock market and you see that, uh, that American automakers are really seeing their stocks go up. You're seeing very few Volkswagens, very few Mazdas, very few Toyotas driving around. You're seeing a lot more Fords and Chevys and Dodges and those types of things all around the streets. And you just, it just seems to you that there are a lot more American cars. So you start doing some of your research and some of your digging and you find out for a fact, yes, American-made cars and, and trucks are on the rise and foreign-made cars and trucks are on the decline. Why is that? Why are fewer healthcare professionals making house calls? It used to be that they would go door to door all the time. When I injured my ankle, my next door neighbor's my doctor, he came right over. But would he have done that if I didn't know him and I just called him and asked him to come over? Well, come to find out, no, they're not doing very many house calls. Why is that? What's, the, what's caused that trend? Now, obviously, that's a stretch. That's been happening long ago. But why are the Dallas Cowboys no longer America's team? I jumped off the bandwagon. I was saying before most of you got in here growing up, that's why I got into sports was the Dallas Cowboys and Roger Staubach and Tom smarter. Landry. And they do what? Americans are getting smarter, obviously. <laughs> oh. The education level of Americans is going up. What is it? What is it something with them? Has some other team supplanted them? Is it professional <clears throat> football as a whole? What is it? Why has that changed? Jerry Jones. Well, Jerry, okay. I'm not looking for answers I'm right now. I'm just kidding. I know. But, you're trying to find out why these phenomena are happening. Okay, so think along those lines. That's what we're going to be looking at with phenomenological study. Definition of a phenomenology comes from Schramm in 2003, page 71. The study of people's conscious experience of their life world, their everyday life, and social action. The people's the study of people's conscious experience of their life world, their everyday life, and social action. So notice the focus is on experience. What are people experiencing? What is going on in their lives that's making them choose one point of view over another? Or why have their opinions swayed? Why are they acting in a specific way now? Okay. This comes from the 20th century school of philosophy associated with German philosopher Edmund Husserl. It started during World War II when researchers became discontent with um, European, the struggling European capitalism and how Europeans were really having a hard time making it out of World War II. Remember, much of Europe was damaged. A lot of lives were lost. A lot of businesses were lost. And they were really disappointed that it was not improving quicker. It was not building faster. Why is that? What is causing that struggle? Jeff, you're smiling back there. You just said damaged. It was devastated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, it was devastated. It was crushed. And they had to bring it back. Okay. Again, our focus is on experience. We're not looking to categorize and simplify and boil it down to the barest, barest bones. We want to know what are people experiencing. What did people experience on this campus that made them love this university so much more? What have people experienced with American vehicles versus foreign vehicles that made them want to purchase them more? What is it about um, making house calls? What have physicians and nurses experienced through those house calls versus office calls that made them focus more on staying, at, staying in the office instead of, the off, instead of making those house calls? Okay. And so with that, you're looking for the shared experiences from your group. 
you're looking at yes ma'am how is that not categorizing you're well in a way it is you're but you're trying to take those categories and pull it all together into one so you're not trying to find out well they did this, 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 and this. How, what was it in common that they had? What was that one commonality that they really focused on? So, so you're, your gonna, you're gonna have to. very broad. Yeah. It's gonna end up being their total experience, what it was that happened. So yes, you are gonna, I know it sounds kind of hinky to say it that way, that well, you're not gonna categorize. You're gonna have to categorize. You're gonna have to look and see well, these things happened, and these things happened, and these things happened, and put those into those categories. But what was that shared? It's almost like doing the Venn diagram sort of thing. Everybody knows what a Venn diagram is? Yes, ma'am. So that means you could come up with multiple conclusions, right? You could, but you're looking for that one that really jumps out, the one that really stands out, where they all intersect. Because you can get, all right, well, we had that category and this category, and we have that category over there, and then we have this category over here, and where do they all intersect? They really don't, okay? But we do have some kind of, you know, that's only those two, this is only those two, well, this is three of them, and that's only those two, but this is three, so it might be just those two. It's these two major areas where it really sticks out, okay? Because you're looking for the, the phenomena, not the phenomena, the phenomenon that's really cost us. So do you have to do sort of retrospective research as well? For example, the second question that you have there, why do more Americans buy domestic cars? Wouldn't it be prudent to find out why they were born, buying foreign cars prior to the switch to see if there's a correlation? Well, now you're talking quantitative research. Well, right. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm just saying. Yeah. If they, no, if notice, they, notice what does all this preclude? Why? Well, you're looking for a why, but that preclude, that's not the right word. It's changing what? from something. You're changing from something, so before you can see why it's happening, you have to first find out what was there. So this is where, again, qualitative research becomes much richer, or takes quantum, sorry, qualitative research enriches quantitative. Because you find out what was there, and now why has it grown? We have to make the decision that yes, Dallas Cowboys were America's team. Okay, that's what they were. Now why aren't they anymore? And what was it? What were those categories and that came together to form that one phenomenon that took them from being America's team? Does that answer your question? Yeah. So according to Alex, Jerry Jones is phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> no, no <laughs> it can mean good and bad things. <laughs> yes. Like the word amazing. <laughs> what do you do when you interview somebody that does not think that that is fact? Like if you were to ask me why are the Dallas Cowboys no longer America's team, I would say they were America's team. You're going to have outliers. Those people that don't fit in with everything. Okay. But that would so be. Do you get rid of their answers? You set them aside and say, you know, as we did this research and got into it, I mean, the what we determined was yes, the Dallas Cowboys were America's team. We have this group of people who never agreed to that or never agreed that they were. And so then we kind of we ask you to say, well, why do you think they weren't? Uh, and then you don't really, they don't really fit in with your phenomena, they just become kind of more background information and they just become a subset of, well, these are the ones who didn't think they were in the first place and this is why they didn't like them. The group for further study. A group for further study or this is why they didn't like them and now the phenomenon says this, it's just grown exponentially since then. Okay. Well, so a phenomenological study could be um, like you end up finding more answers than, can you risk like Buy off more than you can chew. That's what I'm saying. You saying. can do that with anything. Well, well like, I mean, is it particularly a problem, and that's one of the risks of having a phenomenological study? It is, but keep in mind, this one you could pretty well indicate. You might do a quantitative study to really find this one out. Okay, you could find out, you do a study of UCM students and faculty and staff and find they think better about the university now than they used to. 
and then go to the next step of your phenomenological study. This one here, document analysis is going to be able to tell you that. Going through and looking at the, the, uh, the trends and the, the sales numbers and things like that, you're going to be able to see that one. Uh, this one here, probably do a survey to go find that one out and build that one. Find, find that they are doing fewer, and then you go do why. This is just a bad, this was more of a flipping in, flipping one than anything. You're really never going to be able to find out where they actually Americans team. Okay, because if you can't really quantify, yes, they were. I mean, even if more Americans like the Cowboys than don't, that doesn't make them America's team. That was just kind of, I'll tell you what. <laughs> we'll just delete that one. And just, I'm leaving it on my paper. You go right there. That's out of confusion. Kind of going back to Rachel's question, though, with qualitative, aren't you more selective in your sample? So as opposed to quantitative, when you have a random sample yes. that covers those outlier possibilities, mm -hmm. when you're focusing on that shared experience, mm -hmm. you would be more selective in picking people that are going yes. to kind of give you what you want? Yeah. So like, are you going to get people who are driving foreign cars for this yeah. study? Oh, yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Mm, not really. For, for, for a phenomenological study trying to find out why more are driving American, you're going to talk to those people who drive American because you want to find their shared experience of what it was. Now you might find people... I thought that you're randomly going to walk up to somebody. You're going to run into people. You're, you just this, you're structuring this. Okay. You are structuring it. Okay. And keep in mind, I say, um, where is it? The primary tool is the interview. That's the primary tool. It doesn't have to be the only tool. Okay. You may think of doing focus group. And in that focus group, you may go and get one group that's only driven or ever driven American. And get another group who drives foreign to find out why. And then you get a group that used to drive foreign and now drives American. Okay, to see what was the shift. This group over here that drives American, what is it? And we may find out, Patriot, by God, I don't drive anything, but everything's American. Okay, go check your underwear. It's probably made in Mexico or somewhere like that. <laughs> okay. You go over here and you talk to the ones who drive only foreign. Why is it? Well, because they're cheaper. They're, be they're better gas mileage. They're smaller. They're not as boxy. I just like the style over here. I, yeah, I love the United States, but by golly, I'm, I've got to think of my pocketbook. And this group over here that said, well, yeah, the gas mileage is better, but if it breaks, it costs me more to fix it. And so you're trying to find out what it is with that group. So you end up with really three different results there. Okay. But the one you're really focused on is why they're buying America. Okay. See, this is why I'm not using a PowerPoint. Ah, uh, where were we though? It is very well suited for studying emotional experiences. So something like school spirit, you know, they're they're excited, they're cheerful, they're happy about it, studying those types of things. You're looking for the concrete. You're trying to find out, and this goes back to what Rachel was talking about, you're going to have some categories, but you're looking for that one concrete response, that one concrete answer. So think about number two, why they're buying American. I'm in marketing. And I work for Ford, American company, American as you can get. No, Chevy, that's Chevy. Isn't it? And that's Chevy, the old Chevy commercial. Most of you don't even know what I'm talking about. The old Chevy commercials. Baseball, apple sauce. Baseball, apple pie, and Chevrolet. Baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet, okay? I work for Chevy. I do marketing for Chevy, as American as you can get. Thank you. See, Bob's got my back. He moves. And I want to know what that one thing is, because if I've got five different reasons why people are buying American, it's awfully hard to really push that one agenda. So I need to know what is that one, what is the essence, what is the concrete, so I can focus on that area. Okay? Why do you think that interviews are the primary tool? Experience. The key, uh, the focus is on experience, and the only way <coughs> You can't, you can't generalize if you don't talk to each person. Yeah, I, I need to know what you experienced. And <coughs> sitting in and observing you now is telling me about your experience now, at this moment while I'm here, but it doesn't tell me anything about how you came to this point, how you came to this reason. Okay. 
also because of um, it's good for studying emotional experiences, and I think that's harder to get when, like, for example, if you did a quantitative study, um, you could put a list of adjectives to describe this is how you felt, but like, excited for me could be a different definition. I interpret excited differently than Mike over here does. So if he, we could both put excited, but it. I do. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I thought devastated in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just thinking that the interview you can, especially if it's in person. I mean, I don't know if the researcher does it or if he picks somebody else to do it the way you do fo focus groups. But if the researcher is the one doing conducting the interview, then they can get all of the nonverbal cues to really understand what that word excited meant. And that's the big thing, is I want to get those nonverbals. I want to be able to observe that person thinking for him or herself mm -hmm. and how they came to that opinion. If you think about with a focus group, yeah, you can, I mean, that's another way of doing this. I mean, yes, we do use interviews in a focus group, <coughs> but I can't focus on that one person and their emotional response necessarily. And again, when you think about the, the issue of groupthink, or of you've got the dominant speaker and other people are going to back off, I'm going to lose the richness of their information. And, we, and again, with groupthink, that may not have really been your experience, but then you get to listen to somebody else talk about it and you start thinking, hmm, yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way before, but yeah, that may be a reason. Well, then actually that really wasn't a reason. You never really thought about that. You had another reason for buying American. That was on the the surface, and that's what you really were thinking about. This might have been in your subconscious, but it really, if it's in your subconscious, it's really not motivating you as much as something you're really bought into. Does that make sense? Okay. So, for instance, like uh, like the social media stuff, like if you if you ask something and to your you know potential customer about your experience in there, does that consider also studying a phenomenon? So is that, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Why are more Americans using Instagram now than Facebook? Did they have some sort of experience on Facebook that really turned them away from it versus Instagram? No, also, but what I was saying more of like that you draw <coughs> the question in social media and then the people respond to that. Will that be some sort of interview related? It is, but it's the, the weakest way to do it. Okay. Yeah. In, okay. Email, I am. Facebook, you know, trying to do interviews through those, you lose all of that. Interactivity. The only emotion you're going to get with something on Facebook is what? Smiley faces. Smiley faces. Emoticons, or if they do all something, caps. or they do something in all caps. Yeah. And honestly, even at that, my sister-in-law, I did some. I called her out one time on Facebook, just joking around with her. I said, "Hey, Heather, stop yelling at me. Whenever you type in all caps, you're yelling at me." I got a hateful call from my brother-in-law the next day that I had offended his wife and she left the house crying because I had embarrassed her so much on Facebook and you know she's a private person. I'm like, well, why is she putting everything up on Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Sorry. not everybody knows the, the, the etiquette or the rules of Facebook. And so then I had to grovel and apologize and you know, I felt very, very bad because I adore my sister. Why didn't you apologize? Huh? Why didn't you apologize? You didn't do anything wrong, did you? I apologize for making her feel bad, or for embarrassing her. <laughs> because she's my sister-in-law, and I have to keep the peace. <laughs> you should have just clicked the like button. Huh? You should have just clicked the like button. I know. Oh. <laughs> so, okay, but you see what I'm saying? You can, I mean, if, if worst comes to worst, that's the only way you can get information, that's fine. That's a way to get some of their information. Yeah. But you're not going to be able to get the emotion that goes with it, and you're not going to be able to probe. Yeah. Well, I, I just thought about that because we were talking about marketing mm -hmm. and about selling and stuff, and you know, yeah. maybe that is a medium or something. It's, it is definitely a medium that you can use, yes. It's just not the best medium. Okay, good. Now, you need to think, about, think again, or think, keep in mind that with the interview, you still need to do the matching and keeping the distance. Why is that? When you're doing a phenomenological study, why do you need to do that? You don't want to negatively or positively or in any way influence um, the interviewee's uh, opinion. Right. 
But the mat, doing the matching, that's how I have the feeling that there is an increase in school spirit at the university. I just, it's what I've seen, and I'm, excited. I'm wearing more of my UCM stuff, you know. I don't wear my Colorado State gear. Whenever I'm here, I wear my UCM stuff. And I, you know, I've started going to more of the plays and more of the concerts and more of the lectures and things. And, you know, I like to talk about the university more, and I feel better about the university. So, I'm having that experience, and I'm noticing it around campus, and university relations to the study that seems like it's improved. So, I can put myself in the place of my subject and see, yeah, things are going better, and things are more positive here. Why is that? But I have to, I can't remember where I wrote everything, I have to, to create distance because I don't want to assume. I have to put my assumptions aside. Otherwise, they may not do what? Obviously, I may bias the study, but what may, what may I also do if I have my experiences and I'm putting them into my subjects? Yeah, you may ask questions like leading with that on, like on, without being on purpose, I guess. I may ask leading questions or... You may just get the agree. Where you actually don't get a full answer at all. They're, they just agree with whatever you say, which doesn't even give you an answer to determine anything. So if you're just writing down agree, you know, that's not from them, that's from you. Okay. Well, that's also <clears throat> like confirmation bias because if you're against vaccines and you're asking questions <coughs> on that one side, you're completely ignoring the other option. Yeah. I, I think you also run the risk of being personally upset if it doesn't, if the answers aren't congruent with yours. <laughs> You know, you're like, wait a minute. No, I hate this place. What? <laughs> <laughs> I may not ask a question. I may, I, I may be looking at my experience, and I may just take for granted that's how everybody feels. And so I may not even ask the question. Okay. And keep in mind, one of the, the, the goals of research is to find the truth. We're trying to find the phenomenon. And if I find that, man, I've increased. There's not a more school spirit here, you know, this this quantitative study that somebody did, um, nope, that's not really true. That's okay. That's part of research. You find out it's not there. It's actually, people have always been positive about this place. I must just be looking under the wrong rocks. So you need to keep that in mind too. So you have to put your own experiences aside. Know what they are. But then set that aside so you can go with the clear questions and you can be and you can get the answers that are actually there from your subjects. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me give you an example. When I did my study, my uh, dissertation, one of the things I was looking at, well, the overall goal behind my dissertation was how can college sports public relations professionals gain more influence in their athletic departments? Now, I didn't know that they didn't have much influence other than from my own experience. But I didn't care if they didn't have any. I wanted to know how they could get more, because you can always get more. I wanted to know how. And one of the survey questions I asked was, and I was trying to find correlations, I wanted to see if years of experience correlated significantly with um, increased levels of, of influence. And I come to find out, statistically, no, it was not significant. It did not matter how much experience you had, you weren't gaining more influence. But I also asked a couple of open-ended questions that were qualitative to find out what it was. And the ones who had the most influence, I found a phenomenon. They had more experience in their athletic departments. Well, that didn't match. Same thing here. You do a quantitative study, you find out, yep, there's more school spirit today than there was 10 years ago. You do the qualitative study, no, not really. You can't find that if you go in with the preconceived notion there's more influence and you address your questions that way. Okay? You have to accept that you may be wrong. Mike? Wouldn't that almost be a flawed study trying to compare uh, the level of school spirit now compared to 10 years ago? when um, those students then may have had as much, just didn't want to close as much, but the perception and 
students today don't know the experience of those people, so they don't know whether it's an increase. They just know how to take it. My quantitative study was looking at that, so we're looking to see if there if students today have more school spirit than then. And you're, and you're not going to just look at the close. You're going to look at all the different factors that you're probably going to come up with some sort of a factor analysis, and you're looking at a concept of school spirit, and they have to score a certain level. <clears throat> so, so attendance to the plays and dance recitals are doubled. Attendance to all sports are doubled. In, in per, per, per capita. Of, per yeah, capita, yeah. yeah. Um, and people wearing more red and black and cheering on, even talking about sports or what's going on. The university's building this because we're great. And everybody's like, yep, 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 it's good. And then you go talk to people. You say, no, it's just it's all the way it's always been. But that would not, not be disproving the quantitative just because this unit didn't know the difference from the back. Previous. Yeah, and understand. I'm not saying you're going to dis <laughs> I'm not saying you're disproving the other study. I'm just saying that what we really thought we were seeing with that quantitative study may have been elevated. May have been uh, when they really get into the why of it, and they really have to stop and think about their experiences. You know, when you write on a piece of paper, and you know, how many of you have ever done a paper and pencil survey or a survey over a computer or something like that? A few of you. Okay, so. Agree, strongly agree, strongly disagree. You put a number to how much you agree on something. Okay, so you get a lot of people who, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that, and you get really high numbers and high, uh, high positive that people really agree that yes, there is more school spirit. But then when you go and you talk to them about it, I have more spirit, have more spirit now than I ever did. It's not so. It's not really increased. It's just the same level. Okay, so you're not really disproving that study, you're just seeing that maybe it's not quite as extreme as we thought it was. Okay, but at the same time we can find out, well they do like this. Their school spirit is where it is because of this. We have great theater productions at this university. Well, we need to start advertising that more because our students really like that and they really appreciate it. Maybe we need to do more shows, longer shows. Or school spirit is up because our academic programs really have become more enriched. We, you know, we've got more programs that are getting accredited. Well, by golly, we need to start putting resources into our programs to get more of them accredited so we can advertise that. Or our basketball team won the national championship last year, so we really love this school. Come on, Mules, win it every year because we want the we want the attendance up, we want the spirit up. Okay. So when you're so with the the, the part about you know, school spirit. When you're when you're delving into that, would you want to? I know you said when, when doing the uh, diagram there, the possibility of two phenomenons with phenomenons with that because one, like in quantitative research, uh, when Scott and I did the uh, online newspapers, we had to define what we what would qualify as social media. Mm -hmm. So when doing school spirit with the changing of uh, uh, technology and increase in social media use and stuff like that, would you want to have that second, uh, like where or how do you show your school spirit per se? Because, you know, you might think giving a, a thumbs up on Facebook is considered school spirit, where Ham might think wearing my t-shirt and going to the games, that's what school spirit is. So would you want to have that so then you could maybe answer that? Your, your response could be, and then again, this is why quantitative researchers think qualitative is weaker. Because quantitative, you can find the truth. You can find that number that says this is what it is. Well, not really. I mean, you can see this is the biggest one. You know, you look at mean, median, and mode. The number that comes up most often, there's this one, but that doesn't mean these others aren't there. And in qualitative, you may have two phenomena. You may find out while doing this, two, two phenomena arose. These two reasons are why school spirit is increased. Or these two reasons are the shared experience of our population of why people are buying American. Okay, so yeah, and you would, you would mention them. Now, if I've got like five or six, seven different reasons coming in here, I only have a phenomena. We can't, this, this study was unable to determine what that central concrete phenomenon was. There people have, there are very many different reasons why. And that's, again, that's okay. 
as long as you set up, set up your study correctly, as long as you've done the research, the results you get are what you get. That's what you found out. You need to go back, and, and that's why qualitative research is that constant comparative. You're looking at your results, you're looking to see, now how did I set this study up? Do I need to tweak anything? Do I need to be asking different questions here? Am I, am I asking the wrong questions? Do I need to shift these? Am I being too broad? Do I need to narrow this up? And then do I need to ask some more people? Okay. So you need to keep that in mind. Go. I'm a little confused. And I think the question, like, we'll take the first one. Why is school spirit increased? Great question. But how do you get to that? Especially in a uh, quant you know, qualitative way. Because, say I'm a freshman here, school spirit is what it is. It's not either increased or decreased. So how do you ask a question that would determine how would you define school spirit? Versus... No, just how would you define school spirit? Question one. And they define it for you. Gotcha. How do you see the University of Central Missouri fitting within your definition of school spirit? Oh, we don't seem to have it as much. You know, I believe school spirit is you know, students that go to the university sporting events and they wear the, co the colors and they paint themselves up and they cheer and they holler and they carry on and they, they're going to stick around and instead of going to the bars on a Wednesday night, they're going to the basketball game. Instead of going home on the weekend, they're going to the football game. And they're going to go to the volleyball game and they're going to go to the baseball and softball games. You know, they're going to track meets, all right? Those, event, those sports that don't typically have as much attendance, okay? I think that's school spirit because you're there, you're cheering on your team, that's, it's loud, it's ruckus, that's where you get all the emotion and everything. To me, that's school spirit. Well, how do you see the UCM fitting in, in so that think, definition? Okay. So you start with each individual's definition of what school that's spirit one, is. That's one way to do it, yeah. Okay. And that's where I was kind of leading towards, is that other part of it to really find the definition of what, what is. Mm -hmm. I mean, with, with a school spirit to everybody, because then you can observe, you know, as a, uh, is there an increase on likes on Facebook? By their definition, liking on Facebook is school spirit. Is there an increase in people going to basketball games, football games, and such? Uh, by observation, do you see more people wearing t-shirts? Now, keeping in mind that part about is there an increase in likes, that's quantitative, because you have to look and see, you have to have a starting point and see how many likes they had at this point, and then you have to go to this point to find out, now is there an increase in it? So that's going to be the quantitative part. Okay. The quantitative is easy in that regard because of the terms of attendance. I've been here for a long, long time, and it looks as if we've got a great fan base at a basketball game, but I remember when the side bleachers had to be pulled out yeah. and filled. So all the surrounding the court was full, and we haven't seen that yet. Mm -hmm. And that was in the 90s. So, it, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, so I, I, I follow what you're saying in terms of define for me what school spirit is. Now, do you think we have it? And do you think we have it in great measure or whatever? Right. And that's where, you know, you don't want to focus on, you, you're not going to ask 15 freshmen, first, especially first semester freshmen, do you see an increase in school spirit? Why not? They've been here to know right. if it's if it's increased or not, okay? My, so my, my one have to work backwards once you have uh, your um, qualitative question, why is spirit increased at UCM? Before you even ask that, you might have to go back to the quantitative to find out from people do you think it has. You might even have to, to go even further back to define what that is, so a survey, what is defined as it? Another survey, now do you think this is it? And then finally, can you start going with qualitative? Quality? This one. Okay. <laughs> this, this is where I'm going to. This is where I'm going to say, you talk to another professor and they're going to tell you something totally different than I am. But in my mind, to really do a good phenomenological study, you're going to have to start quantitative, because you're going to have to know is what I I think there. Is there an increase? I can't say by my experience it seems like there's an increase, and I can't just assume that everybody else agrees with me. How do I go find the people to talk to in that case? It's going to be much, much richer if I start with the what. It seems like there is, 
So let's go do a quantitative study and find out, is, has there been an increase in school spirit? Or is school spirit really high right now? Doesn't that even necessarily have to be, why is school spirit increased? Why is school spirit high? Okay. And then we go from there. You come here in the back. Yeah, I was just going to um, say to what he was saying about defining um, school spirit. I think that is the main thing in your study. You have to define what are the concepts you're looking for, and then through that, you get to know, okay, well, I'm going to study school spirit. First, I have to define what is the school spirit for me, because mm -hmm. the school spirit for me could be going to the baseball team or going to the, you know, all the different games, but also means maybe that you're just going to the theater, you know, and, 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 and or participating in something else. So you really have to define everything that you're looking for first and then, you know, so you can have an idea what to ask and that sort of way, like, that will help you out like, with your results, right? Mm -hmm. with the findings. Yeah, and that's, you know, again, you're going to talk to some professors and they're going to say, no, 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 no. You want to just focus on the quality. Don't even mess with that quantitative aspect of it. And that's fine. That's their choice. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind, Tuesday when we talked, I said one of the reasons behind quali the youth qualitative is because it can really enrich quantitative research. Yeah. In my mind, you have to have the what before you can find the why. And can you just make that assumption and go off of your experience? Sure you can. And you can just take it from there. But did you start at the right spot? Yeah. Okay. I mean, is that is your method so that you don't run the risk of um, of changing your question because your results are not what you were expecting? Like that's why you want to find the what first? In some instances, it's not going to be necessary. I mean, I can find, you know, this what's going to be kind of objective or subjective. Okay, This one I can find just through doing document analysis and, and seeing the trends that I know it's there. Okay. I can't really go in there and say why are more Americans buying foreign cars when that's actually not the case. So that's part of your doing your literature review and finding out what's there to begin with. Here, part of my literature review would be studying school, looking at other literature about school spirit, seeing how other people have defined school spirit. And so with that, I yes could just do a qualitative study without doing a quantitative part, but that changes the question that I ask. And so that, and that especially I would change how has it increased? It would be more, how is school spirit at the University of Central Missouri? And I would find this phenomenon of it's pretty high because of these factors. That makes sense? Yeah, but is there a benefit of not finding the what first? Is there any benefit at all that, that other professors would see that you're not seeing? Because you said you, you feel this way, but other professors we talked to. I'm a mixed methodologist. And some are qualitative, straight up, so through through, and others say? are quantitative. Just what would they say? The ones that are qualitative? Yeah, completely pro-qualitative. Numbers lie. You can make them say whatever you want. If you ask the questions that you want to ask, you're going to get the responses you want to get. Okay. I don't care about all that stuff, and I don't want to take the time to do that, to have to do all that development of that survey and send all that out and everything to tell me what I already know. I'm going to just change the question to fit, to just do a qualitative. You know, neither, none of them, in my opinion, none of them's right. None of them's wrong. That's just the way I would like to do it. Well, and I, another point that Aaron was talking about with the whole social social media thing, I think the problem with using that to like quantify something is, well, this many people use social media now, but five years ago, what about these people? Like maybe school spirit has an increase for UCM or the whole liking on American car websites is different because, yeah, maybe it's like there's a trend of it getting bigger, but maybe that's not because the people are buying more American cars or like social media or like school spirits getting bigger. It's just because social media has gotten bigger. I guess that's, I don't know. I there's of, more social media, there's more push for it. Right. Yeah, or you know, there's more people on social media, so the people with more spirit has an increase. It's just they're just using it more. I don't know. Yeah. If that makes any sense, yeah. I can see that being a problem. But again, you see why it's so critical to number one, do a good literature review. Right. And number two, good study design. And that's going to come with, to answer this question, I'm going to have to have a what? I'm going to have to have, I'm going to have to know school spirit was here, now it is here. And the only way I'm going to be able to do that 
is through what? A quantitative study. Okay? If I don't want to do a quantitative study, if that's not who I am, then I have to change my question. And that's okay. But you <coughs> it goes to your study design. Mike. Okay, um, changing the question can narrow the focus down a lot. Why is attendance down at theater and sporting events? Um, that, that leads to the idea of school spirit, um, but it's kind of like a subset of it. But you wouldn't have to do any quantitative research to find that because they have debt. They, sales, ticket sales are down across the board for the last five years. Mm -hmm. that, why? So would you have to do quantitative for that or just be able to jump if you If you've got the data, if you can go look at hard data, we're going to talk later on this semester about document analysis. Okay. You don't have to. It's, don't get document analysis and content analysis confused. Yeah. Document analysis, you're looking at records, you're looking at census numbers, you're looking at sales. That's looking at data that's already there. Content analysis, I have to create the data by going to look at the different content and then I quantify it. Okay. So just because there's numbers, don't think we're talking a quantitative study. Does that make sense? Okay. That's a good question. All right. Um, these three terms, reduction, horizontalization, and imaginative variation. Reduction is that constant return to the essence of the phenomena. That constant return to the essence of the phenomena. So we may find out why are more Americans buying domestic cars. The essence of that phenomenon is they're buying more American. Why? What is it about American vehicles? Is it they're being built better? Is it they're now cheaper? Is it that people feel safer in them? Is it an increase in patriotism? What is it? And we keep coming back to that. Because if it's the patriotism, well, what do you mean by patriotism? What is patriotism? Why does that lead you to buy the American vehicle? Because, okay, well, Toyota, Japanese vehicle, they're made in America. American workers are making them. It's not, they're all not being made in Japan and shipped across the sea, you know. So what is it about an American made vehicle? At the same time, the horizontalization, all the data is examined equally. I don't right off the bat go, okay, well, I don't agree with this one and toss it out. I'm going to look at these categories that seem to be coming up, and I'm going to look at them equally to see now, is one of these showing up more often than the other? Or they, did they put more emphasis on this? And you can think about it this way. I may end up with five categories, okay? Cost, gas mileage, patriotism, durability. What's another one? Resale value. Resale value, thank you. That's five, I got those five responses, okay? So that's going to look like there's five reasons why people bought or buy an American, right? Now, do I have the phenomenon? Can you categorize? I'm sorry, no. not using that word. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> These you, are my five categories. Can you derive a root cause of all of those? Because several of those can be explained by value. They can be, or this one was mentioned by two people, or by five people. I, I interviewed 15 people. This one was mentioned by five people, and they just said, um, it's got great resale value. Patriotism, they talked about at great length. Gas mileage, well, that got talked about by a few of them. Um, durability, they talked at a long length about they, their families made cars, they're strong, they're durable, they can withstand a pounding, they can withstand the weather in the United States. I don't remember what my fifth one was, but a couple of people mentioned that one. Okay. So you start, in that regard, you start thinking like content analysis. Okay, because you're documenting everything. You're making a list of all these, these areas. You're, you've got your five categories. But these two, they talked about at great length and with great emotion. These other three were mentioned. Okay, so what's my phenomenon? The two that really struck a chord. Okay, and I may, like Rachel was saying, I may be able to put a group together that well is the value. They don't have to pay very much if, there's, if they need repairs. They don't need repairs very much. They get great gas mileage, so I don't have to put much into them there. And then they have great resale value. So the value of these cars. 
you could even like identify between durability and like patriotism and say maybe it's the essence of like protection. And so they think they're protecting their nation, they're protecting their family. That's good. I like that. Okay. So now we have value and durability. Okay. So that makes how sense. is this horizontalization? Because aren't you unequally I, I have to start by looking at them equally. I can't just discount these because they didn't seem to jive. I only like five people talked about these, but they, those five talked about them really in depth. And these other three, they, they talked about it, just not as in depth. These other ones mentioned it. Does that make sense? When, and then I've got this other category. They all talked about it pretty quite a bit. The, the, the idea is you just don't throw anything out right off the bat. It's like brain, when you have a brainstorming session, you don't go, no, that's a stupid idea. Because what does that do? Well, that squelches anybody else talking about it. I mean, I've done, you know, done some analysis of the interviews, and at first I was like, no, that one doesn't really fit. And the more I read the other interviews, the other transcript scripts I went through, I kept going, oh, wait a minute, I gotta go back and look at that. And it turned out being one of the big, one of the big themes. Well, I was trying to visualize this study in my mind. So basically, horizontally, you would post those five and then start to assess the value of them. And then, you know, if it was a balancing scale, the two or three that came out with the strongest Yeah. You're going to get it. It's going to look a little bit like a content analysis once you start transcribing your notes and transcribing the... Um, the uh, interviews because you're going to start numbering off and you're going to start looking at okay um, somebody talked about I just I want to buy American I'm an American and I want to buy something from here patriotism well I have three kids and I want to make sure they're safe and I've had a foreign car and I've had an American car and when I, I had a wreck in that foreign car I got rear-ended and it totaled the car I got rear-ended in the, in the like American vehicle and knocked my bumper off you know, so I, I want to make sure my kid, durability, safety. And you start looking at those, and then when you make those themes out, you're going to count them. So they start equal, but they weigh themselves through the study. They weigh themselves Eventually, as you start right. analyzing the results. Okay. Because you're going to look at which themes were mentioned most often. I don't, I don't like how... It kind of says it like they weigh equally, but... Yeah. I see what you mean. Eventually, they won't be equal. They start. Well, if, equal. if they stay equal the whole time, you can't have a phenomenon. Right. That's where things can be spread out, and I think that's where the confusion might be. Is you have to start looking at them equally, but then you start calling them down as you see these are mentioned more, these are mentioned with more gusto. Okay. Because again, you're looking at people's experiences, and it's a great way to study emotional experiences. Make sense. Okay, the last one, imaginative variation, that's where you're examining the phenomenon from various perspectives. You start examining the phenomenon from various perspectives. What do I mean by that? Isn't that what you do every time you have an interview? Because you're getting a new perspective every time you interview somebody new. You married? Yes. You have kids? Married with three kids? Married? One in the oven? Okay. That's three different perspectives. I love that term, don't you, Leah? You can use that sometime when in your writing. Thank you. You got three different perspectives. So examine it from their different perspectives. You're a veteran, right? Yes. Okay, you're a veteran. Anybody else in here a veteran? You're a veteran. Okay. I'm not. I might have a different perspective. Okay. So you start looking at it from their different perspectives to see, well, maybe it's this, it's a phenomenon, this is a phenomenon for this group. For this group, they have a wholly other reason why. Because then, when you're thinking about marketing, okay, I'm going to market it this way to this group, and I'm going to market it this way to this group. Okay. And I know this isn't a marketing class, but I mean, you think about from a communications perspective, we do a lot of times when we have, we're doing a movie, 
movie, we're going to market a movie a certain way, or we're going to script a movie a certain way. When we're working in journalism, we're not going to write for a different type of audience a certain way, unless we write for a specific publication. We had a conversation in um, Media Effects about this and, and how the DVRs sort of mixed commercials and the the um, conversation got back to, well, they're getting to you another way because they've already accounted for those folks that mix commercials <laughs> sort of fast forward through. I'm like, that made me feel manipulated in some way. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see the future of television and film because if we start doing all DVR and online where you can avoid watching the commercials, how are they going to pay for it? Yeah. I mean, I, yes, I can pay for subscriptions, but it's like a newspaper. I have to get a subscription to a newspaper. That's not what's keeping the newspaper in business. Mm -hmm. It's the advertising. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, when you use YouTube, on YouTube they give you a chance to watch commercial now. Yeah. And for example, I choose to watch the commercial just because the commercial is getting better and better. Then they're just like short films, which are entertaining and high quality and stuff. So basically, they, they will have to step up the games instead of just so just, just basic competition. Yeah. Exactly, the competition will make them more clever and yeah. make us want to watch trailers, for example. Back in the day, no one watched trailers. Well, what's one of the biggest games of the Super Bowl? Who's going to win the the commercial wars? Right. We binge. My family binge yeah, watched. That's the event now. That, yeah. that becomes the event or a part of the event. My family binge watched once a <coughs> time over Christmas break to get caught up to the season. And they, when you watch them online, they make you watch the commercials. You cannot skip the commercials. And my kids, 13, 10, and 8, oh, I hate the commercials. Why do I have to watch the commercials? I'm like, we got to watch the commercials. we got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> well, they always go, you can just pause it, Daddy. Smart. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're saying more, like you look at movies 25, 30 years ago, you didn't see a lot of uh, real world items, products in movies. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, you see so much of that. Or the product placement, clothing, ooh, ooh, cars. Ooh, phenomenological so. study. <laughs> Why do people watch the commercials now? Why are the commercials targeted a certain way? Or why are they done a certain way? Well, and why do people fast forward through them, too? That's why moment. do people fast forward through the commercials? Okay. There you go. See, study idea. Woo <laughs> if, you watch, if you watch uh, Charlie's Angels, the original TV show from the 70s, that was Joe Ford's. That was product placement 40 years ago. I'm sorry, I heard Charlie's Angels. I thought Farrah Fawcett. <laughs> she drove the Mustang. It was always four. I can't even remember a car once. Did they have Did she drive a car? <laughs> I thought she just let the feathers go, and that was it. <laughs> um, I'll give you a good example of how uh, industry will adapt is the trailers. Why do we still call it trailers, even though they are in front of the film? Back in the day, they were after the film. So people want to see another film, just stay after the film and watch the trailer. And then they realize that people don't stay and watch it, so just let bring in um, before the movie. And, and they, they make it some sort of event as well, and people just start eating, and, and, and the food sales goes up, just because people... Dang, involved. I hadn't thought about that. They, come early. they did go after the movie, didn't they? Well, the Marvel franchise, have you noticed what they Oh, well, they always have some little tag on the end, so you yeah. stick oh, around yeah. for all the yeah. credits. Yeah. No one's yeah. yeah. Marvel yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Oh, I didn't know about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I went to, he was Captain America, and I left before the end, and somebody the next day saw me, and they said, did you see Captain America? Yeah. Well, did you see the trailer for, the, this is the, the original one, yeah. going back when, did you see the trailer for Avengers? I'm like, what? <laughs> you didn't stay till the end for all the credits? I'm like, no, oh, you idiot! <laughs> Well, in other words, they're, they're, they're I'm going to have to edit this whole end of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that. Oh, yeah. um, the, uh, the way that uh, people are countering ads online or on YouTube or any website is getting an add on to Chrome, Google Chrome called Adblock Plus. So it'll go in, figure out what the headers and the banners, where the ads are, and then it literally blocks them out so you don't see them on your end. Here's the problem with that if a website primarily gets all their money from those, which obviously we already know that that is the case. They lose some of that because, first of all, you're not seeing it. Second of all, you can't click on it if you don't see it. And so there's some websites now that have taken account of that, and where they have their ads, if you have that ad block plus on, it says, please disable it for this site because this is where we make most of our money. You think I'm kidding. I've seen it. 
I'm sure. And so I'm like, okay, sure. If that's if that's what you want me to do to help you out, I'll do it. Well, I get mad. My wife says, I just they need to do away with commercials. Communications professor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we need to get rid of first grade. First <laughs> grade. <laughs> <laughs> Related to what you said, should we go back to the caves just because someone asked us to? This is progress. I lost my job just because of the progress. I used to work as a um, projectionist in the cinema when we used the tape. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I lost my job just because we have digital projectors, which everyone benefits from. And should I say, please, please don't, don't change it because I want my job? No, this, this is what we have to. But we need Go. to learn to adapt to exactly. it. And that's, and that's right. where the media, particularly newspapers, yeah. have faltered. Yeah, if one is company goes down, yeah. another company will yeah. rise. So but that's where, like in newspapers, they've stayed with the old business model of we're going to make all of our money off of advertising. And then people want to say, well, they're gone because they're dying because everything's going on the internet. We get our content off the internet. Well, that means that the printers should be losing their jobs, not the journalists. Because it's still, they still have to get the stories to put out there. Well, five years ago, I, before I came back to the university, I, I worked for Yellow Book. And they are, you know, the managers and the top brass are all print, print, print. You got to sell ads in the, in the phone book. And, and the frontline sales folks that are in the field are going, wake up and smell the roses. No one uses a phone book anymore. And... I finally got tired of fighting it and said, I'm not, you know, I'm not doing this. Now, they, you know, they had all kinds of other electronic and, and um, digital ways to, you know, for folks to look, you know, they went to a phone app where they, you can look up somebody's phone number on, on your app and stuff. But it was so far behind where the technology was that that really adds to what Mills is saying. That, and this you've is, got to adapt or you're going to die. And this is where phenomenological studies can come in handy is you look and see what's the phenomenon. Why are people no longer using landlines? And then you, so you can look at, okay, then how do we get phone books or whatever we're going to use into their hands? The, the only people who failed worse than newspapers in, follow, in modernizing their business model, U.S. Postal Service, telephone service with phone books. Three weeks ago, power went out and not master. I couldn't go online and find get a phone number to call out West Central and ask them why. Pulled out a phone book, West Central mm -hmm. called. So they're useful. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're not done. Saying, they're still yeah, okay. Yeah. Doesn't mean they have. Right. Okay. Today's Tuesday, right? Or Thursday, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Start See you next Tuesday. Tuesday. We'll be talking <laughs> night grounded theory. Is that what we're talking about? 9 30 Tuesday? Huh? Nine 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 I learned my lesson. You want to be here at 9 30 on Tuesday on more power? Y'all have a great weekend.